We gotta go to the bullpen. Welcome to the Highland Bullpen. Uh, Whatever you're listening, uh, and whenever you're listening, it's currently Thursday evening with the gents here in Scotland and England uh, for Dave. Uh, we've had quite a mixed week and we're going to cover off a few things uh, this week. Uh, myself and Alan made trips over to Seville. Uh, we've got a good catch up in terms of where the baseball season is up to date. But something that I wanted to touch on briefly, just to drop on the gents. Um, two things actually. Firstly, tonight's podcast will be in memory of Ray Liotta, uh, who played shoeless Joe Jackson in Field of Dreams, which we've covered, mm-hmm. uh, covered off quite extensively. Um, in the podcast over the last few months. So it's definitely something, uh, again, we've, we've spoken about Field of Dreams uh, to death. Um, but again, Ray Liotta, uh, yeah, we could probably cover off a whole podcast talking about his movies. Uh, let's try and fit in some Ray Liotta puns throughout the, the podcast if we can. Uh, but the other one is, can you think why, and I'm not talking about baseball here, gents, but can you think why tonight may link in to the diamond? And I don't mean the baseball diamond. Mm-hmm. Ah, you got me on that, Dave. We're all going through the different types of diamonds that we can contemplate, but I'm, I'm guessing none of us have been sufficiently close to any of the fancy jewellers down there, Guile Arcade, to, to go in that direction, young man. I'm more of a cubic zirconia kind of man, to be honest. Yeah. Airs, woman. Is it something about this date, the the twenty sixth of May? No, just. Well, I'll give you a. In fact, I'll give you the answer, Richard. So, from what I can see in my records, tonight is the sixtieth. So, the the diamond anniversary, uh, historically, it's the sixtieth episode of the podcast. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, well, well spotted. That was a landmark that escaped me, young Dave as well. So glad you were on the ball on the baseball. With that, um, yeah, sixty episodes I've been doing. Then with you, good fellas here. Uh, so it's been, uh, yeah, it's been quite a ride, quite a ride so far. Thought it was always been the field of dreams, but it's certainly been a lot of good, good stuff in there as well. Uh, and yeah, though that's and really, Ota, as you rightly say, Alan, a terrific, terrific actor first and foremost. But from the tributes that have come in already, it's clear he was held in high regard as a person as well. I think quite a lot of people talking about how uh, you know he's that tough guy demeanour that was so quintessential to his characters it was actually the opposite of how he was in, in real life. I think he was quite a, a gentle soul. And I think he said himself that the only time he'd ever gone to a fight was like in, in the school playground over sports, perhaps over baseball. Who knows? But uh, certainly it's a, it's a, a big loss to, to the world of, of acting. And certainly he's left a lot of fantastic memories and the great roles that he played, most notably for us in Field of Dreams. Alan? Yeah, um fairly confident that I would come fourth out of four in a film quiz amongst us. Um, But I I noticed that he died in Dominican Republic where it's a wee bit of a baseball stronghold. There's a few Dominicans come over to the MLB. So was he from there originally or is that somewhere where he chose to spend his latter years? Do we know? Filming? I think he was filming, Alan. He's actually think, filming. Uh, yeah, that, I think he yeah. was, because, I mean, he's got a busy filming schedule. I think there's another couple of movies that obviously were completed before his death that are yeah. still to come out as well, and they're always quite poignant, aren't they? But there's something about people being away on island somewhere. I'm sure Shane Warren would have been a bit younger, but not that old. Well, yeah, been mm-hmm. a bit younger. Recently died in a kind of one of the islands in Thailand and stuff as well. But I think he was filming, Alan. I think that was why he was out there. And I think he may have had some kind of background. I think he was a classical kind of Italian American background, I think. I, I'd um, assume so, yeah. I got the... New Jersey, I think. Yeah, well, New Jersey would be a classic, classic kind of uh, upbringing for the. I'm sure Sinatra was a New Jersey boy as well, and lots <laughs> of other of America's great. It's Italian American stars. So. Yeah, I watched Goodfellas again the other night. You know, it remains one of my all-time favourite movies and stuff as well. But I think Ray Liotta was brilliant. And everything that he was in, really you're quite young as well when he's in Good, Goodfellas as well, which I hadn't probably appreciated as well for such a mature performance. But Dave Ince, uh, I know you're a man that knows his, knows his movies. Is there any particular Ray Liotta ones that you stand out for you? Yeah, I hate to say, I'm not, yeah, great. Goodfellas is 
a great movie, isn't it? But somehow, I, you know, I do, it, it makes me squirm a bit, you know, it's just sort of, I heard people say that it is, um, you know, I don't know how realistic it is, but, you know, it's pretty, you know, some of, some of the scenes in it, you know, get me a little bit. So, and he's almost like too good an actor, isn't he? If, he? if he's a blessed nice guy, you know, he's quite frightening uh, the way he could change so quickly, but amazing. But yeah, I mean, I think the shoeless Joe, um, the feel the feel the dreams. It's more or less so. It's consecutive films. I think sort of thirty odd years ago, wasn't it? So um, yeah, yeah. It's you know, it's tragic when you when you do hear of somebody dying. It's not exactly on set, was he? That, but he, he was away doing um, another another film. But um, I didn't know what it was that he was filming actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure either, but certainly, yeah, and, and as we record this, the news is literally fresh, and, and already there'll be, you know, there's numerous tributes coming in, as you can imagine, from someone with his kind of profile and, and history within the world of Hollywood. Uh, Alan, Feel the Dreams, we have covered it before, I know that, yeah, Dave Jr's done some particularly nice pieces on it in the past, including a nice review, uh, that's where we're seeking out in our previous episodes, but it's uh, Field of Dreams remains a favourite for you, Alan. I know you're a, a misty-eyed idealist at heart when it comes to your baseball and your sports. Misty-eyed idealist, love all that romantic history, but you've got to throw in the stats as well. I still, um, you could fluctuate between that and, and Moneyball, obviously, as well, but um, no, that Field of Dreams obviously has some iconic scenes in it. Uh, and were, were they not recreated when they played the Field of Dreams game last season then as well? And that's, that's what we all love that sort of stuff. Um, in, in, in terms of, you, you mentioned there's a New Jersey boy, actually, <laughs> slight tangent. I went to see Jersey Boys in the theatre the other week, which is the Four Seasons story. So, yeah, they're, they were Italian boys and there as well, although they might not have um, uh, been as prone to avoiding a little bit of a, um, inappropriate behaviour as the Four Seasons might have been. There was quite an interesting backstory in that then as well. So it's amazing the cultural stuff that we four get up to. People just wouldn't believe it. So we were really culture vultures and yes, People would not believe that, I'm sure, uh, Alan. But it's yeah, and that's that Frankie Valley, the Four Seasons. It is Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. Yeah, um, I can imagine the music would be pretty terrific in that. Yeah, oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, um, I don't know whether I admire the people who go in the audience to stand up and sing along. Um, I think, do I wish I could do it, or do I think, gee whiz, even if I could sing, there's no way I'm going to do that. I'm just going to sit in my chair, chair like a good. Highland bullpen laddie and uh, be quiet and take it all in. And, uh, excellent. I'm assuming the story is fairly, is obviously based on real life stories. So I, I, I like these things as well. I like the music, but I also then enjoy, you, you get some basic information about the story, which is pretty much what, what you're looking for then as well. And it helps you get through life a little bit. What theatre did you see it in, Alan? And what would you give it out of 10? We saw it in the King's Theatre in Glasgow. So I love the King's Theatre. It's, I think uh, it's more historical in the Theatre Royal. They're part of the same group. But uh, yeah, that would be my favourite one. What would I give it out of 10? Ooh, ooh, yeah. yeah, it was pretty good. I'd give it an 8 out of 10. Um, I'd go along, but I'm sure it's probably finished. It's run already, so you can, you can no doubt. It'll, it's probably been on in Broadway for 15 years or whatever, and we'll get our odd wee spot here as well. But yeah. Um, go and give it a go. Enjoy yourself. That, that sounds good. That sounds good. And wherever wherever you are, wherever you're listening to us from, yeah, check it out. If it comes on near you, it's definitely worth worth, worth seeing. I think. Uh, and in terms of, we'll talk a little bit about field of dreams there. For my Mariners, it's most of the fields have been a bit more nightmarish of late. You know, after all my big hopes and a fairly strong start to the season, we have fallen off a cliff. I, uh, and one of the things I've noticed is that from our point of view, spoke last year about how the Mariners were winning a disproportionate amount of close games. So the games that were being sailed by one run or two runs, the Mariners were invariably coming out on top. That's been reversed as well. You know, it's just now we seem to be losing those close ones where, you know, we're already really a long way behind where we need to be at this stage of the season. 
Uh, or you know, we did we did have a bad patch last season and recovered, but I don't know. Uh, my my confidence has drained away somewhat, but I don't know. Uh, Alan, the the Tigers, what your confidence levels like? Have they been soaring, or have they, or, has, or has your confidence been draining like mine? Oh, drain, draining constantly. It's uh, yeah, it's like uh, it's like your battery on your phone as it goes through the day. You know, it's going to get to zero at some point. <laughs> it, it goes there. Uh, yeah, we're we keep saying we're relatively new to the sport, but. It, it's odd. I mean, last year the Tigers showed some signs of going places. Um, their last three or four months were winning months. We've we then took in a few young, good pitchers. They seem to have traded well with Baez in there from the the, the Red Sox, wasn't he, Dave? Um, started the season okayish. Uh, then we met the White Sox. Then it sort of started falling apart. Um, I think 15 wins out of 43. Uh, that keeps them one win ahead of the mighty Kansas City Royals uh, out of bottom place in, in, in the division. Um, the, other than a, they swept the Orioles I, must be a couple of weeks ago at, at Comerica Park, but pretty much losing every series. Uh, gets swept in a four-game series by, by Houston. I... Uh, one out of five against the Athletics. Uh, Tampa Bay beat them 2-1. Uh, we managed to share a series with the Guardians simply because we got a game postponed. Uh, so that's clearly the way to go about and do it. And then the, the good old Twins beat us. So we're back at the time of recording. We're back playing the Guardians again tonight. But yeah, it, it, it's draining and... Yeah, I'm all in in Detroit sports teams, and I'm I'm starting to feel what I think Detroit sports fans feel all the time that this this is not going very well, and there's not much going to positive happen soon. I don't I don't know. I must have mentioned that when I was over in the US recently, I did see the Red Wings. Um, so I actually saw them beat the Hurricanes, who are one of the were one of the top seeds. So I've not not many people can probably say they see the Red Wings winning, but um, I. I was enjoying the alcohol, but I don't know if the locals enjoyed my chant of we can see you sneaking out as the, the Red Wings went 3-0 up. But you've got <laughs> to enjoy these moments <laughs> if you if you choose to support sports teams that aren't quite going to be too successful. So, no, I think there's plenty of chat that uh, uh, AJ Hinch not, not quite following through with it this year. So what... Uh, what's the, the franchise owners going to do um, as we get towards the end of the season? So the rebuild doesn't seem to be going particularly well at this point in time. Eleven and a half games behind, and we're still in May. Yeah, yeah. You and I, Alan, have, our teams are in a very similar state, to be honest with you. And I guess actually, the are all two bullpen bros. The various shades of socks, the white socks and the red socks, they're not a million miles away either. And they're currently, as we record this, they, they've split a series one game apiece with the deciding game to happen uh, a few hours from now. But there are a couple of remarkable games. I think the White Sox beat the beat Boston 3-1 in a relatively close, hard-fought contest. And then Boston dished out, to use one of my favourite words in the whole world, a shellacking. I think, was it 16-3 or something similar? Uh, I certainly got 16 runs, Yorkshire Dave. So it was there. Uh, yeah. So you, where do where do you think the Red Sox are, and and who's going to win in a few hours' time between the first series between the Red Sox and the White Sox? Yeah, well, on the evidence of those two games, you'd say it's, it's, it's difficult. But, you know, the, the the thing about the Red Sox is uh, traditionally they always hit, and uh, they weren't doing that really in the first part of the season, apart from. The um, so-called three-headed monster, De Rafi Devers, Xander Bogarts, and uh, JD Martinez, and they're all still hitting over 300. But they weren't getting too many contributions from the rest of the lineup, and notably, the the big signing um, of the close season was Trevor Story, who was brought in. He was a short, fantastic shortstop with um, Colorado Rockies. 
and um, a great hitter, but he's playing playing uh, second base for Boston, and he had a very slow start to the season. And, um, you know, so much so there's a lot of questions being asked about his numbers. Was he able to hit out of, uh, hit away from Colorado? I mean, this is a guy, you know, not that I, <laughs> no expert on the matter, but I thought, well, I'm pretty sure he was in last season's home run derby and uh, got through to the second round. So anyway, it wasn't really happening for him. And then all of a sudden it did. And it coincided with something. You can, you can date all this back, the turnaround in fortunes down to the 10th of May in Atlanta when Alex Cora um, arrived in the dugout with a, a clean shave and he <laughs> shaved off his beard. And they promptly won the game 9-4, which, uh, as I say, coincided with Trevor Story uh, finding, finding his form. And, uh, you know, this has been mentioned on this. And not only... <laughs> Joking a little bit, but uh, they're something. Their record is something like uh, ten and four, um, with um, <laughs> Cora without his without his beard. So you know, sports players are uh, superstitious uh, beings, and uh, you know you you see him in with a stubble, but you're not going to see him grow his beard back uh, this this season. I don't think. And in fact, I would say the ten and three because. The, the very next game, he was thrown out after a really bad call, which pretty much cost them the game. And at that point, they were, st- they were still tied at the game. So they lost when he was <laughs> ejected from the game. But the thing with Trevor's story <clears throat> just shows you, you know, I mean, it's a long season, 162 games, as we keep saying. And, um, you know, they were making judgments on 20-odd games, and uh, he's at a new club, getting used to a new ballpark. And uh, all of a sudden, it's, it's turned around so much for him that he was AL Player of the Week last week. And um, you, probably, you probably saw it did, you know, it, it did do the business against, against the Mariners. And uh, in, I think, game two, he got three home runs. And then the very next, the very next day, he hit, you know, it's going for when something like this happens. He hit a grand slam into the uh, green monster seats. And the guy who caught, a fan who caught the ball in the front, so it turned out to be none other than Johnny Gomes, who used to field in left field. <laughs> and actually, he only played a season or two, I think, for the Red Sox, but he won um, a World Series. And he's, he does some work for Nesson, but when he's, in town and not working, he just goes and watches the games and he caught the ball and went absolutely mental. And they, they phoned him up. There's a great um, video, a couple of minutes, where they, they phoned him up live and uh, had an interview with him. And he's quite a character, this guy. So, you know, having, having said all that, they're still under, 400, uh, under 500, so they've still got a losing record. So, you know, I think... They need to get back to 500, and then we can start thinking about them. You know, being a playoff team, they're, they're miles behind the, the Yankees, who started off like a train, haven't they? Um, but really, they're only three or four games off a wild card spot, with you know something like 120 games to go. So, you know, I think they're getting contributions from other players as well. Franchi Cordero, real bonus this season coming in. I think he's platooning a bit for the first base with Dolbeck. He got a walk-off grand slam the other day. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of good stuff in there. One thing which I think is a worry and possibly a reason why they were losing a lot of close games, you know, the bad record early on, they don't really have a recognised proper closer. Likes of Liam Hendricks, who, you know, in the early season matchup against the Red Sox. He closed out two games in consecutive days, um, whereas uh, the Red Sox have had nine blown saves um, this um, so far this season. And that was a couple of weeks ago when they had that against a league average of three. So you could see they were losing a lot, you know, in, in winning positions, not closing it off and losing. So that, if, if you know, if they were 
sort of successfully closing out games to the league average, uh, there would be a post five, you know, above 500. So um, it's their own fault. They haven't got a proper close. I don't know why Matt Barnes last year was, he made the all-star uh, team as a closer last year, but the second half of the season didn't happen for him. And it's, um, yeah, they don't seem to have a go-to guy for that all important, you know, your one run, two run up, close the game off. But uh, I'm, I'm encouraged by it. And I still think Cora is just a great manager and the players love him. And uh, long may he remain clean shaven. <laughs> yeah, and I think you're right. I think there's no need to panic from a Red Sox point of view. They, they seem to be picking up a bit of momentum, a, pick, a bit of form. But obviously, if they're going to continue that recent revival and they've won seven of the last ten, that would also mean there'd have to be some heartbreak for Dave Jr. Because obviously it's his Chicago White Sox who you're going to be facing off, as I say, just a few hours from now. Dave Jr., your Chicago White Sox, I think are quite a lot of people's dark horses for the World Series itself before the first pitch was thrown this season. Would it be fair to say that your, your guys haven't quite lived up to that so far, but it's still early days? I'd say so. I, I, I'd say that's very fair, Richard. Um, again, White Sox Twitter is full of uh, lots of <laughs> varying views, as, as each club's uh, will be as well. Um, there's definitely, when you start to delve into those games so far, there's definitely you know, some aspects that you, you can have a look into and think that's that's affecting things so far. So if you'll excuse me, I've just been writing down a couple of things so far. Um, bear in mind, we're only, what, about 40 games in. Uh, tonight will be the sixth time we've faced Boston, uh, who are on a bit of a red-hot run. we faced the Yankees seven times. The Angels, who are high-flying four times. Tampa Bay three times. Um, and also in that run, they're... We're still missing at the moment uh, Lewis Robert and Eloy Jimenez, as well as Lance Lynn, kind of star pitcher. However, it's only two names. Um, the rest of the squad should be big enough to to still pick up some wins. But for the last 20 games or so, we've really just been win one, lose one, win one, lose one. Um, the damage was done early in the season when we really did have a whole host of injuries, which some of which are still niggly. But even when you look at your starting pitching, Three, you know, your top three pitchers from last season were all unavailable through injury or having left the club. Um, in Giolito, Lance Lynn, and uh, Carlos Rodon, who's away to San Francisco or San Diego, always got those two mixed up. Um, and again, one through to nine, you're missing a whole lot of injuries again uh, across the board. So, although it's not an excuse for recent form, uh, and again, recent form dictates we really are picking one up and giving one away each time. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, there's been some tricky games. The, the slight concern that I've got is that although it's been it's been touted that the White Sox could have a better end to the season when you look at the scheduling, which to me still blows my mind that over 162 games, surely these things even out. Um, but when you start to look at the White Sox for July and August and then into September, it would be deemed a little bit of an easier run. Uh, and again... But June, I, I worry that the White Sox will fall a little bit further behind in June as well, because after we finish with Boston tonight, you, know, you get a couple across the city against the Cubs, and although they're, they're failing, it's still a, a bit of a derby game. Um, but again, in June alone, you've got the Blue Jays six times, uh, Tampa another three, the Dodgers three, Astros three, and the Angels three again. So, and that's in June alone, those are all teams that are flying very high, Um and again, without trying to be disrespectful to Detroit, uh, uh, Kansas City or Cleveland, those teams who really have kind of losing records just now. And usually, if you're going to win your division, you've got to beat those other four teams within uh, your mini league. We haven't came up against each other a lot. And those games all seem to be scheduled in towards the end of the season. So uh, the Twins have really came out of nowhere and they're doing so well this year. Uh, they're leading our division by about four, four and a half games. Um, I didn't really think they were up to much when I've seen them, but you know, it's, the record speaks for themselves. They're doing, they're doing pretty well. They're doing enough to lead the division and they're doing enough to really create uh, a, a title race where people thought it would be the White Sox to throw away. So there's definitely an interesting few weeks coming up. I'm not too sure June 
the end of June will look much better than the end of May. Um, but it's about getting those guys back, picking up some wins. Uh, again, the two games against Boston so far in this series perhaps sum us up. If we're beaten, we're beaten quite heavily. Um, and unless we can sneak out the odd win, like last night, a 3-1. And again, that 3-1 only comes about some strong pitching from returning Giolito. And also Jake Berger's home run scored us those three runs. So you've had one scoring play to an extent throughout nine innings. Um, I'm not sure if just, if just now is the right time to cover it off, but there's been quite a big story uh, in MLB in, in regards to Tim Anderson and a racism row and the Yankees. Uh, it might be something to return to later, um, but that's, that's really been quite interesting. I'm not sure if any of you guys have seen it at all. I hadn't seen it, heard some, some talk about it. Dave Jr. So even if you want to maybe just give us a quick, you know, update for those that haven't had the opportunity to see it yet. Yeah, I mean, no doubt um, if anyone wants to chip in with what they've heard and from what I can see on the screen, maybe Dave's the only one. And I'm not sure Dave will be, I think Dave might be as biased against uh, the Yankees as I am here. So I will be very honest and say that my, um, you know, my feelings come from a White Sox point of view. You know what it's like with your own football teams, your own baseball clubs. You look after your own. Um, so what happened is, now, you might be familiar with the name Josh Donaldson. He's he's jumped from baseball club to baseball club over the years. I think he's a fairly proficient, a, a you know, really good player. Uh, everything that's come out recently tends to say he's a bit of a dick. Um, he, he's just that sort of character. He may be the guy that your opposition just loves to hate. He could be a Scott Brown. He could be a Nacho Novo. He might just be that type of person that gets under under the skin of the opposition. Um, but it, it looks as if, and it feels as if he's perhaps crossed the line in this particular occasion. So he's, he's had a real run-in over the years with other teams. Sorry, whilst playing for other teams, it tends to be in the American League Central, and he's had a real... Um, a, a checkered history with the White Sox uh, and the players and the fans, and he's our he's our kind of hate figure anyway. Before this, uh, again with some run-ins with with Tim Anderson, our shortstop. Um, so, what happened on Saturday night is that all of a sudden um, Tim Anderson and Josh Donaldson had to be separated whilst uh, whilst the play, and you're both benches empty. Nobody really knows what's going on uh, until after the game. Uh, and it comes out that Josh Donaldson keeps referring to Tim Anderson. Uh, for those that don't don't know, Tim Anderson would be a real um, poster boy, I suppose, for um, African-Americans. He's, he is put out there by the MLB. Um, it's been a real, um, a real leader amongst the, the black community in baseball. Um, so he was referred to consistently by Josh Donaldson as Jackie. Um, you know, easy up Jackie, how's it going Jackie, things like that. And I think it was a straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and it, you know, it, again, for those of you that may not realise, it's a reference to Jackie Robinson, who, as everyone in this podcast will attest to, any baseball podcast, any baseball fan, is that probably above all others, even Dave's favourite, Mr Williams, um, you might find that Jackie Robinson is is kind of heralded uh, above all others and his what he'd done in the game. So it turns out that Josh Donaldson has been kind of saying this for a few years to Tim Anderson, and his his excuse, his reason is that in an interview in 2019, Tim Anderson said, um, "I want to be um, I want to be like Jackie. I want to bring the fun back into baseball." if I can do what he done for black people, but if I can do that for fun and bring these things into baseball, be a leader. Um, so ever since then, apparently Josh Donaldson's referred to him as, as Jackie. So I think it's, <laughs> it's important to sort of note at this point, I think when you look on Twitter, it's you know, a fairly even split of around 29 of 30 clubs tend to support Tim Anderson here. Um, his own manager, said it's really, he says he understands where Josh Donaldson mindset was with it all, but he's like, just don't go there. Just don't, you know, if you're trying to antagonize, don't, don't go there. 
Uh, his own teammates have come out and said they don't want to comment about it. His ex-teammates have been very vocal that he is not well thought of amongst um, minority cultures. Uh, so, he, again, it's not trying to say he's got a history of this, but he's not very well thought of. Um, so, again, I'll, I'll come in and, and see where you guys are with this in a wee second. But as a White Sox fan, the next day you've got a double header. Uh, first game, Josh Donaldson, and I don't know sometimes if managers over a season speak to other managers, especially on this occasion, and decide a way to what's best for everyone. Um, maybe I'm thinking a little bit kind of pie in the sky here, but it turned out that Josh Donaldson started the first game, Tim Anderson sat off, and in the second game, Tim Anderson started and Josh Donaldson sat off. So you wonder if they've said, let's give them each a game, let's try and defuse this, let's try and let baseball win. Um, but the White Sox, they won the first game in that doubleheader. Um, and then uh, in the second game, TA stepped up to the plate. Uh, you know, with TA being our leadoff guy, he he was very first to, pit, uh, to bat in the whole match. Uh, and he's getting boos rained down from him from the Yankees fans. He's getting calls of Jackie, Jackie, Jackie from the stands. You know, it's not going down too well. Um, and I think it was his third plate appearance with two on base. Uh, he just put the bat through the ball, sent it over the fence um, to lead the White Sox to a 5-0 victory. And I think um, you know, he celebrated quite well, just finger to the lips. Uh, and at that point, the Yankees fans just left the stadium um, a little bit demoralised, I think, it would, what they'd seen with their team. Maybe it takes away from the fact that the White Sox took two games from a, a sort of rampaging Yankees team uh, who have done really well. Um, but, yeah, it was quite a talking point. There's still a lot to come out from it. MLB is having a look into it all, just going to investigate it. Um, the word is today that Josh Donaldson is expecting to face consequences. Um, I think it's more the manner, and taking maybe Jackie Robinson's name into, he's using it in a, in a moral way. So, um, no, it's been quite an eventful few days. Um, TA has come out of it. Again, he's up there with Dave's uh, th three-headed monster, as he said. He's, you know, these guys that are hitting over 350 just now, I think the four of them, um, are doing fantastically well. It's great to see them all face each other in a series. Um, but that's that's kind of been the story of our week, Richard, with, with Tim Anderson and the White Sox. And a, and a big story, as you rightly say, Dave Jr. And, and Yorkshire, Dave, obviously, again, crossing over into the world of, of, of cricket. I know your beloved Yorkshire cricket team have been no stranger to some race-related controversies in recent times. So do you have some insights to add in here, D Yorkshire, Dave? Well, yeah, from uh, Yorkshire's point of view, I'm so pleased with the way they've, they've gone since that you know, controversy and... You know, as soon as I heard about that, just 18 months, nearly two years ago now, I thought, this is not going to end well for Yorkshire. And, um, but the, where they are now with the appointment of Lord Patel as uh, president and all the other uh, basically sackings and appointments that they've made, it's um, quite clear that they're, you know, turning over a new leaf, you know, really showing that they're going to pick a diverse coaching team and let's see where we go from here. So you've just got to do that. You just, this guy, Josh Donaldson, I mean, you know, I, I did hear something on a podcast quite recently saying that last year, and this is it's a Red Sox um, podcast saying that Josh Donaldson, he does have a history. I think we would use the word, He's quite chippy, um, to say the least. But he said the the, the podcast editor was Tony Mars um, in the baseball hour saying that he's really fired up the Yankees. Like last year, the Yankees, although they've always got a good team, the Yankees are always competing. Um, but they, you know, they they didn't have any fire about them. And they reckon, well, this guy reckoned that this guy has fired them up and has made a difference. They've also made quite a few other, got rid of a few guys who perhaps were past their sell-by date and um, made a few other signings like, you know, they're always likely to do. But he's definitely, 
and I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote or paraphrase Aaron Judge on this, who is possibly he's got to be pretty much the leader in the clubhouse of the Yankees, and he's basically said, well, as Josh, Josh Donaldson was saying, this was a joke, an inside joke between them two, because he's comparing himself with Jackie Robinson. Now, I, I personally think Tim Anderson has got a very high opinion of himself. But, you know, he is a great player. I think he does have that sort of arrogance, doesn't he, which is going to wind up some players, and it certainly doesn't... You know, Josh doesn't seem to need much winding up. And um, Tim Anderson was saying that he he's not comparing himself with Jackie Robinson. He's saying he wants to change the game again in another in a way that Jackie Robinson did improve it for black players. Um, so um, yeah, so Aaron just says this um, joke or not, it's not the right comment to make, especially in this series, especially with the recent history. So that was a pretty, you know, from the top Yankee player, just basically, you know, I hope that's pretty much putting a marker down for, right, that's it, Josh, on the um, Tim Anderson uh, front, you know, behave yourself from there. That's that's my take on it, that, yeah, there could be a bit of misunderstanding, could be a bit of winding up, but it's inappropriate. And it's not helpful, is it, in a, in a, in a world, in a game where, you know, you've had so much adverse history on race you know and it's still basically you know it's sort of a, a sport where I don't know if I'm sure did we talk about this last year or did I read about it that you know there's de definitely some question marks over baseball is it as diverse as it could be certainly not as um, other sports but yeah that would be my take on it you know let's just zip it on that front and if, if the two clubs did get together like you suggested Dave that's uh, clever management I think yeah absolutely and I think so that was really helpful as well Yorkshire Dave I think your your knowledge of you know the, the situation with Yorkshire and, and I think that is helpful I guess there is a difference between that was the allegation was a, a racist you know culture if you like yeah that's nobody's accusing you know the Yankees as a club mm -hmm. as a ball club mm -hmm. of being racist but equally I think you made a very good point that ultimately people might be willing to take that Jackie explanation if you like at face value mm -hmm. if it didn't happen to be coming from someone who has a reputation and whom who's given people reason frankly not to give them the benefit of the doubt uh, on this one as well and I see today he's come out and apologised to Jackie Robinson's family as well and I think he's been suspended but you know and, and fined and stuff but yes it all seems really really unnecessary it's a situation yeah. that, and, and as you say like race yeah it's still a factor in baseball it's still a huge defining factor in American life mm. you know, like that beyond the world of sport so Dave Jr I think we uh, yeah I think we're in agreement that Josh Donaldson certainly qualifies as a villain of the week and he might turn out being one of the villains of the season I think for that Absolutely, Richard. And on that note, and to completely change subject purposely and take us into something lighter, what did he feed those boys in New York? You know, when you see Aaron Judge step up to the plate, or you know, uh, Stanton, Giancarlo Stark, I mean, these boys are absolutely enormous. They're just monster human beings. Um, I think maybe the only other, uh, JD Martinez, I don't know if that would be a sizable comparison, Dave, but. Um, these boys are just huge specimens, and they're they're not they're not just tall, they're not just lanky or um, kind of a bit portly. They are actual beasts. They're athletes. They're just absolutely phenomenal. Um, no wonder they can smash the ball all about the park. Uh, that Yankees team on their day, uh, I'm not surprised at all that they're leading the division. They are they're quite something. Absolutely, no, hundred percent. And actually, you know, talking about on-field disputes and and you know, kind of bus stops, got me thinking. There on the and the Yankees, could we be in for a peat of the twenty of the you know the World Series of twenty years ago, where the Yankees met the Mets for the first and only time in a World Series? We've got the Yankees going great guns 
on their side of the divide, we've got the Mets, who, you know, we tipped, I think, at the start of the season, day ones to watch, living up to their billing so far as well. And obviously, Roger Clemens and Mike Piazza were involved in a famous bust up in that series as well, which the Yankees mm-hmm. eventually eventually won. But Roger Clemens launched a broken bat at Piazza as well, and what was a, a feisty a feisty exchange as well. So early, early doors, obviously, but there's no harm in us uh, doing a bit of dreaming. Could we imagine there being a Yankees-Mets World Series and would that be a good thing for baseball? Alan? Yeah, no, no reason why not. I think um, I, I think absolutely a good thing. We all... The, the rivalry, the intercity rivalry is not quite the same in the US as we would have in in, in British football. Um, but I think from our perspective as fans looking in, and there will be sufficient rivalry, you will have people in offices sat together who support the different teams. So there, there is something there. The rivalry isn't as intense, obviously, because they're not used to playing each other on a, on a regular basis because they're in uh, dif- different divisions. Um, I think it would be exciting. I actually listening to Dave talking there to uh, TA. I uh, think well, if if the White Sox get their act t- together, um, you you could not World Series, but you could be having the White Sox and the Yankees playing off uh, at, at crucial stages um, uh, of, of our league, and, and I think that <laughs> that might add a little bit of spice in there as well, and. I know we've talked before, Dave Jr. and myself, about where do you build these rivalries and how do you get these rivalries into baseball um, because they, they, yeah, they just don't really exist in the in the same way. Or we're looking for something, but yeah, um, I, I think that that sounds exciting. And I'm assuming that's what the leagues were set up to do by having the different city teams uh, apart. They're probably it's probably done to avoid them playing each other and having that immediate rivalry. But uh, I'd like to think somebody was clever enough to think that you could have the ultimate game uh, representing New York or Chicago or whatever. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see that. The Tigers aren't going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and neither are the Mariners, unfortunately. Uh, Yorkshire, Dave, I guess if it was to be a Subway Series this year in the World Series, uh, we can safely assume that you'd be rooting for the Mets in that one. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, I think I've said it before. You know, New York, New York team, and it's not the Yankees. So, uh, you know, you've got New Yorkers who presumably <laughs> don't like the Yankees, or maybe they root for each other. But uh, yeah, a World Series, um, New York World Series, would not have been unusual. In fact, it was pretty much almost every year in the 1950s, post-war. It was, of course, there was sort of half as many teams and there's sort of eight teams in the in the AL and eight teams in the in the National League, and the the Yankees were sort of uh, perennial winners of the AL pennant, and um, you know they played the the Brooklyn Dodgers in the final four or five times. I think the Dodgers managed to win it once. Uh, but there's also the the Giants, obviously the San Francisco Giants now, but they were the New York Giants, and these two were both um, um, National League teams. So uh, yeah, that was uh, it was a pretty common thing in the 19, late 1940s and the 1950s until, of course, the two the expansion and the franchise moved um, west. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, if uh, if, um, if, <laughs> if Red so- one of our teams can't get there, I think that would be, you know, a really interesting World Series for for the neutral fan. Absolutely, no, absolutely. Well, certainly the Mariners and the, the Tigers are already out of the running. Uh, the Red Sox and White Sox have the quality to be in the mix for that, mm-hmm. uh, but I think you'll have to step it up a gear against some of the other teams this season. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I don't know what... Because um, obviously there's a trade deadline coming up, which is quite often the key to winning, you know, taking your team from being competitive to and just getting to the playoffs 
but um, to to be getting to the World Series and potentially winning it, and that's when you see, you know, the 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 teams in contention who've got the money make a big trade. And um, actually, what Dave was saying, certainly getting into the playoffs, it's very true. Like if you look ahead, you know, you can't be hot all the season round. You know, you will have um, sections where you go into a slump. Um, and then where you get hot and go on a, on a, on a good um, a good win. But if you can finish well, and if the, the White Sox, I think Red Sox had a, a good finish last year to, to just make it. You know, if the White Sox, um, you know, you look at the numbers now, I was just looking at them earlier. And so I think if you look at the standings, the MLB standings, White Sox record against teams with over 500, so winning teams, seven and ten so presumably you know their win against teams uh, losing teams is something like um, well how many games at 15 and something so there's quite a big difference currently yeah you're knocking over the, the wee teams but when it comes up to the big teams you know you, the, the hot teams you're yeah, perhaps not doing so well and um, but yeah just try and win series you know get to 500 you've got to get back to 500 and both of us, both our teams are just below that. And then it's about, yeah, trying to win each series. So if you take a series 2-1, 3-1, even get a split away, if it's a four-game series against a strong team, then that'll, that'll take you to the, the playoffs. Yeah. yeah, I think somebody worked it out. Um, because of the poor start, um, somebody was looking at it's probably just arithmetic, but it was quite cool the way they did it. Was saying that you know, from now on, um, Red Sox need to play 608 baseball, 0.608. So, you know, you're winning 60 games out, 61 games almost out of 100 to have equal the same records that they had last year. So, that, that's you know, it's, it's very doable. But it just shows you, you know, what what a slow start can do. You're you're, you're behind the eight ball to use a American expression straight away, aren't you? Absolutely. And Dave Junior, then you mentioned that your White Sox have got that tough June coming up as well. You're currently four and a half games behind the Twins. Kind of surprise pace settles there. If I offered you right now, you'll still be exactly four and a half games behind them at the end of June. Would you take that? Right here I, think, now. I think I take it, Richard. You know, again, running through those games earlier, what was that, 6, 12, 18, including Boston tonight, 19 games before the end of June, which I would deem, again, at the moment you could say those teams would reach the playoffs. Boston, Blue Jays, Tampa Bay, the Dodgers, Astros and the Angels. I would be surprised if you know, if most of them were not in the in the playoffs. So as Dave said, that's that's. Just, I'm really interested to hear that approach. Maybe I've heard him say that before, but over the last year, I've always thought, win your home series, and then if you can go away from home, if you can tie a series, um, or if you can pick even one up out of the three, um, you're, it's going to put you in a good position. Uh, you're going to do well. Have your team winning, you know, with a winning season, and it gives you half a chance. And if you get good players in your team, like the White Sox do, uh, like the Red Sox do. Again, I would, I'm sorry, guys, I'd put them above the Mariners and the Tigers just now. Yeah, um, but I think that X factor will always propel you to win that third game out of three uh, and move you into the playoffs. Absolutely. Well, while two of the bullpen bros have realistic hopes still of, of reaching the, the postseason and will watch their fortunes caref carefully over the next days and weeks, Two of our bullpen bros, including one who's in both of those camps, uh, got to see their team in football reach one of the great showpiece occasions of the, the European football uh, season uh, in, in Seville, the final of the Europa League, where Rangers, representing Glasgow and Scotland, took on Eintracht Frankfurt. And it was to be a really close and hard-fought game and a case of what might have been for Alan and for Dave Jr., who both made the trip over to... To Spain, part of a huge number, many tens of thousands who went over from Glasgow and other places to support Rangers as they tried to make history and emulate the heroics of their team of 1972 that won the European Cup Winners' Cup. 
Alan and Dave Jr. Uh, so close, but but yet so far. But hopefully, as time goes by, you'll be able to reflect on an incredible achievement to get there and to be part of that occasion. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I think I've said to a few people that my immediate reaction um, is disappointment, um, but more more than disappointment, to be honest. Uh, so close, it's so far. Um, you couldn't lose it in a more narrow fashion. Uh, I thought they certainly played well enough as the game went on, the, the, the chance of, of winning it. Um, left the stadium pretty gutted about the whole thing. Uh, never once did I feel anything that, but pride in what the players had achieved. That they, they had overachieved. They had over delivered. Uh, they they put a lot back into Rangers Football Club that we wanted to see occasions like this that we probably realistically never expected to see. But I do think as time goes on, it will become a fonder and fonder memory. The semi-final and achieve getting to the final it was absolutely fantastic. You, you, you obviously win that game. That's why they're in the final. Um, to, to win it against quality teams... Uh, teams that spend an awful lot more money than Scottish teams could ever imagine. Uh, ab- absolutely fantastic. Uh, a big opportunity we had, but that that opportunity, it, it just, it wasn't fulfilled, but let, let's be realistic about it. We'll, this will go down as uh, one of the great achievements, I think, of, of Scottish football. I'm not, I'm not going to get into debate about what's the greatest or whatever. You might have your own views on that. Richard, um, and, and very gracious of you coming to, to chat with us about tonight. But um, nothing. Uh, it, it, fantastic. And then obviously we, we did manage to get over the line in the Scottish Cup final, which I think was, was just before the awards. And given the allegiances of our uh, Anglo bullpen bro here as well, he might also have been cheering us on on Saturday afternoon as well. So... Uh, I'm really proud of the, the players there done so well. And if you think it's only you're talking about Josh Donaldson and TA a wee while ago, I think 15, 16 months ago, how Glenn Kamara was treated um, in, in European games. And it's he, he gets his reward of getting to the final and, and playing in that team as well. So, yeah. Uh, very, very proud of the boys. An incredible achievement, Alan. I think reaching a European final is uh, as great an achievement as any Scottish club can manage for a nation of five and a half million. Germany, for example, from where Frankfurt are a nation of 80 million yeah. uh, with all the, the money and resources and all that goes along with that. So absolutely. There was uh, some stat that like since 2008 in the two European finals, I know there's three now, in the two European finals we have, Something like only six countries or seven countries have been represented in finals since 2008. So for those of you who watch the Eurovision Song Contest, there are a lot more European countries than that. So it, it shows you money brings success and money brings power. We, we, don't have, we don't have the systems like American sport does of maybe evening it out a wee bit more. So, yeah, well done. And I know yeah. Dave Jr.'s got a lot of good, good chat and thoughts on the, the occasion as well. Yeah, I would just say though that uh, Alan, uh, Australia don't have any entries in <laughs> Europa League, although they do participate in Eurovision. Um, no, I mean, I, you'll cover it off a whole lot better than I do. Um, so I'll just sort of pick up a couple of quick points. I am not going to let one missed penalty uh, ruin what was otherwise both a fantastic trip and an incredible European run. Uh, again, for the man himself, Ramsey, that missed it. You know, he never put a foot wrong at Rangers in his time here. The only problem was he just didn't spend enough time on the pitch. Um, that's that's simply it. He was uh, he was a stand up guy. Uh, Seville as a city is incredible, absolutely beautiful. I'd love to go back. Um, and the Germans that came over uh, to kind of make you know that that fifty fifty final were fantastic, absolutely wonderful. I was dreading bumping into them after the final. Uh, passing them down the street, but they were so gracious, uh, well-natured, and just enjoyed their run as well. I don't think they've got a, a, a fantastic recent history of winning 
Um, so fair play to them. They've they earned it. Um, it's a horrible way. Uh, <laughs> it's another thing I thought of, but you have know, known Dave for about 25 years now. For 24.9 of those, I've maybe had a bit of banter about uh, about penalty shootouts with Dave for his obvious international allegiances. Um, but yeah, I should have went, learned one thing off him, and that was not to take on Germans in a penalty shootout. Um, so the other thing, although you look at it all and think what a great journey, I am not sure Rangers in my lifetime again, you know, there's an argument to say they may not reach another European final, but I'm not sure that Rangers will ever have a better opportunity. I don't think Frankfurt were as good as some of the teams that we'd seen on our way to that final. Uh, and bearing in mind that we got to that stage by playing two semis and a final without a striker. Um, we really missed our wee guy, Alfredo Morelos. I think uh, it could have really turned the tide, but that's that's just football. That's the way these things go. Uh, but no, a wonderful experience. It's maybe something to cover off at a later time in, a, in more detail. The trip itself, either aside from the football, you could talk about all day. Um, but all in all, uh, it was wonderful. You can see why now your know, Rangers fans mock Celtic a little bit over the years for going on about a defeat in Seville. But I think when you get to that stage, you take that number of fans over, um, you've become so emotionally invested in a tournament, in a side, uh, you can see now why even a defeat can mean so much to you. Yeah. Well, one thing you're, you're talking about, Ramsey, there, Dave, one, one illuminating moment for me in this, this whole thing as well was I've obviously not supported a team before who has been on the, the losing end of a crucial penalty shootout like that, that, that I can recall. Um, and I always felt really bad for the guy who missed it. I, I'm not sitting here sort of feeling the same way for Ramsey because I, and I think the positive out of that is that, that this is a team effort. Uh, and I think whether I've matured or whether football's matured or whether... I'm able to look at this whole experience as what Rangers achieved as a team, as, as you say, completely outweighs the fact that one of our players who, yeah, he's, he's done his best at Rangers. Admittedly, I don't think it's worked out the way either party necessarily wanted, but that's a team sport. Um, individuals make, there were other mistakes in that game that you can look at that are sufficiently as important perhaps as, as the penalty. Um, so I, I feel better about that now. I've always had this horrible thing that all, all these poor English guys that have had to go up against the, the bloody Germans in a penalty shootout and missed um, have had to live with it. But yeah, Gareth Southgate's done okay for himself. So yeah, but let, let's move on. Fin fantastic occasion. And Dave was right to point out the contribution of the, the, the Frankfurt fans as well. And, uh, we were we were sat in a nice pub enjoying some tapas and some beers and they, they were coming along and chatting to us and, and, and joining in what have you as well so yeah great great experience yeah and, it's, and I can see having watched my team lose a, a final narrowly in Seville it gets better as time goes by it's very raw at first because all you can think of is that you didn't win but yeah I think Dave Jr's already kind of making the salient points here about actually giving time you reflect upon what it took to get you there, what was yeah. given by the players and managers and fans to get you there. Actually reminded me a bit of when I was young and I was a Dundee United fan in my youth. Dundee United beat Barcelona and Borussia Dortmund on the way to reach the UEFA Cup final, which they lost narrowly to IFK Gothenburg. Barcelona and Borussia Dortmund were much better teams than the team that actually beat yeah. them in the final. And I think Rangers experienced that, putting Dortmund out in particular. But the other teams, I think there were two or three teams better than, than uh, Eintracht. And it's just penalties are so cruel. And Ramsey might get criticised rightly or wrongly, but he stepped up to take one. Yeah. He takes big, big balls. There's plenty of big name players, plenty of big characters who uh, go missing when they're looking for those five names. So, uh, yeah, uh, and it was... Missing one penalty out of five, a lot of times you still win a penalty shootout. Yeah. If you score four out, you know, if you score four out of five. So. Nine, nine great nine great penalties in that shootout as well. And I, I have a suspicion if the Rangers went down the line uh, to eight, nine, ten, and eleven, there's a few players in there, great footballers, who are probably not great at taking 
penalties. And I, I suppose when I'm saying that thing about Ramsey and like it's a team effort and not is it better that one of your top five guys misses that than you then come down to uh, a centre back who's not renowned for knocking a penalty away, blast it over the bar when it's eight eight. I mean that's that's probably even more cruel as well. Yeah, no, I, I guess so, Alan. That's probably a, a fair point as well. One thing I did want to ask, I know we had two different experiences with one of you, Alan being in the stadium and Dave Jr. enjoying it and kind of a, the, the nearby stadium that was showing it uh, and both sampling and enjoying the, the experience and atmosphere of a Seville Europa League final. But what did you make of the facilities at the stadium itself, Alan? Because I can remember, and it's nearly 20 years ago, they weren't great when Celtic went there either, to be honest with you, they didn't seem to make a great effort. To... Yeah, pretty shocked for a showpiece occasion like that. I don't think I don't think I was shocked that it took pretty much nearly an hour to queue to get into the stadium. Um, we, we might have our own thoughts on the authorities in, in different parts of Europe. Um in, in a way, it was well marshaled, but it's a 40,000 stadium. Where I was going into would have been the, the Rangers end with nine and a half or 10,000 tickets or whatever. It, it doesn't take an hour. The, 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 the gates open at six o'clock. The game kicked off at nine. We must have turned up 7.15. Yeah, yeah. So it's almost two hours before kickoff, and it's 8.15 before you get in. Um People were taking things off them that they'd been told to take and were allowed in, like battery packs and what have you. Um, I, I remember because I got in, I felt I want I, I wanted to be in an hour and a half before the game, and you end up forty five minutes. Um, so I went straight to my seat, sample it all, um, and I think just before kick off, I thought I'm going to go and quickly get a, a bottle of water. The kiosks were shut. Um, you thought that was bizarre. Uh, back at half time, the kiosks are still shut. I didn't quite understand at the time. But I went into the the bathroom, and like people were dousing themselves in, in water. It's obviously in the thirties. It's Scot uh, centigrade. That's mid nineties. Scottish people aren't quite used to that. People are drinking from the taps. We're told not to drink from the taps in, in, in Spanish tap water. Um, uh, pretty astonishing. Uh, that a showpiece occasion could be marred like that. It, 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 it almost feels churlish when you've lost to say that, although Frankfurt are also putting in a complaint to UEFA and, and Seville as well. But <laughs> the normal complaints for these things is you turn up and it's five euros for a bottle of water. Um, just to shut the kiosk and say we, we've ran out before kickoff. Um, completely bizarre. And, and one thing which other people haven't don't seem to be talking about in the social media furore over this is no public transportation. That, that game finished after midnight. Uh, my flight home was at 2 a.m. in the morning. Now, we got texts saying the flight's been pushed back, but you've got 40,000 people leaving a game. You've, you've got 150,000 fans of the two teams in the city, um, all presumably trying to get somewhere afterwards. Uh, I don't understand how the authorities wouldn't have buses going to Seville Airport, uh, possibly Malay Airport and what have you as well. I don't, I don't understand how they couldn't maybe put on some extra trains. But there's a metro system apparently in the town that, that wasn't on or working. We, we were lucky. We saw somebody getting out of a taxi and we just jumped in and he, he, he took us to the airport. But I would hate to think somebody would come to Scotland and it, they would meet that. At, at the Scottish Cup final, I mean, we, we're used to going to kiosks at half time and the pies are sold out. Um, but the Scottish Cup final on Saturday, people were buying food, hot food, as we went into the 30 minutes of extra time. Um, would we leave a bunch of Germans outside Hamden or Spanish outside Hamden and say, yeah, we know you've got a flight, but actually there's no public transport now, so good luck. It's just pr pretty astonishing. Mute, mute. 
There's always one, and it's usually me. No, Alan, I was just going to say that that was the same, uh, exact same experience 20 years ago in Celtic, where they are no public transport. No, the only reason I made my flight was because me and a pals actually persuaded this local guy, not a taxi driver, just a punter driving his car, begged him, waved a fistful of euros for him to get him to take us to the airport, which he, felt, which he agreed to do. And he actually didn't take a single euro off us in the end. Uh, I probably felt sorry because we'd lost or whatever. He thought he was terrified of five very drunk ones. We didn't <laughs> probably thought he was being carjacked, to be honest with you. Uh, but yes, and what struck me when I arrived in Seville, in some ways, like was they didn't appear to be doing anything differently to how they do anything ever just because there was a European final taking place. So I remember when we got there, we couldn't believe that none of the pubs or bars were open. And it was quite about 10 o'clock in the morning, whatever it was, nine and a half, nine, ten o'clock in the morning. And I'm not necessarily saying it's a great thing that we all wanted to get leathered into the bevy at that time in the morning, but they clearly weren't willing to change what they always do, even though they could have made massive great piles of cash as a result of it. So in some ways, I respected them on that side of things. But yes, I had a lot of sympathy for people because my experience was that they did not, did not go out of their way to make the experience pleasurable or easy or something that people would look back on fondly on, on that bit of it. Uh, but fortunately, and we're glad that you made it back to the bullpen safe and sound. And we'll probably touch again on Seville in future episodes because it's such a big such a big moment, such a big achievement for Rangers and for, for Scottish football. And definitely those sporting memories, I think people will relate to them, whatever sport they follow. But I think we're getting close to wrapping up, guys, unless there's anything. I'll go round, round the houses. It looks like Yorkshire Dave is content. Alan looks like he's done and that just leaves Dave Jr. Is it time for us to blow the final whistle or, or throw that final pitch, Dave Jr.? No um, extra innings from me, Richard. Okay, okay. And well, thank you everyone for listening to the Highland Bullpen. We'll be back next week and have a fantastic week in baseball. Mm-hmm.